thank you for being um, so active in helping to educate our seniors in the state uh, what an important role AARP has in bringing information to consumers. And if anything that we need more today, it's bringing knowledge and information to people so they can make their own judgments about what is at hand and make those judgments based upon uh, educated and well understood facts, uh, often facts that are missing from the debate today given the current debate. But I want to thank uh, the panelists and look forward to working with them in this um, meeting this morning to answer those questions that are outstanding and uh, hopefully enlighten folks as to what is uh, currently before us. Right now is a perfect time to be discussing this because uh, in spite of the fact that this has been an issue that has been debated for well over three years, uh, it's still yet to be finally concluded and decided. So there are still opportunities for us to fashion changes to this bill. Uh, in fact, amendments are still in order, if you will. Uh, proposals and language changes are still uh, opportune. Um, and as a result, uh, the bill is still open for, for change. And as such, um, I've even, I'm still working on amendments myself for various changes to the bill. So it's actually very opportune today that we have a chance to discuss this. Um, as my uncle, President Kennedy, rightly argued uh, decades ago, health care is not a political issue. It's a moral issue. Yet politics have mired us down since 1912 when Roosevelt first called for health care coverage for all. Nearly a hundred years of political quagmire must end this year. We must fulfill the moral imperative we have to help every American achieve the promise of this nation, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I understand that this bill has a lot in it, and I understand it raises some fears and concerns, as well as some legitimate questions. But let me tell you, this bill also raises the floor, raises the floor of health care for all Americans, rich, poor, employed, unemployed, business owners, Medicare recipients, everybody. This bill is not just about providing coverage to the nearly 50 million uninsured, although that in itself is a miraculous achievement. And this bill is not just about a public option or the structure of a surcharge on the wealthiest 1% of citizens. It's about systemically changing the way insurance operates so that the health insurance we each have is health insurance that is high quality, affordable, and guaranteed to be there when we need it. Boy, what a change that would be. <laughs> and it's about doing the right thing. If we allow ourselves to get mired down in politics, if we allow ourselves to make the debate into a one-issue fight on abortion, on immigrants, on taxes, then we again allow ourselves to fail as a nation, to fail to achieve, as my father said, and when he wrote President Obama, to realize the character of our nation. A nation that allows itself to remain the only industrialized nation in the world not to provide health care for their population is not the nation our founding fathers envisioned. It's not the nation that many of our brothers and sisters and veterans have fought so hard to preserve. And it's not the nation that I, as elected representatives of the people, believe embody what we as a people are truly made of. This bill is about more than health care. It's about social justice. It's about civil rights. It's about freedom. It's about economic prosperity, international competitiveness, and homeland security. It's about peace of mind and stability and security. This bill provides peace of mind that you can always have, knowing that when you have health care, it can't be taken away, either because you get sick or dropped from coverage because you were sick in the past, or because you can't afford to pay your bills 
once your insurance coverage runs out. That won't happen to any American again. That's what this bill means, and those are the changes that benefit every American in this bill. It means you can't get denied care because you have a pre-existing condition. And it means you can't go bankrupt because your medical bills are there because you have an annual cap on your out-of-pocket expenses, 5,000 per individual, 10 per family. Today, 75% of families that declare bankruptcy attribute it to medical bills. 65% of that 75% have health insurance and go bankrupt. Once we bring everyone into the system, we're going to make sure that we are delivering the highest quality and most efficient care possible. People say we can't afford to bring everyone in the system. Guess what? We're already paying for everybody in the system. You wonder why is it that I get charged such high premiums high co-pays, high deductibles. When I get that Medicare bill and it charges me for that exorbitant hospital visit, how could they charge me that much for a hospital visit? Guess why? Because that hospital is balanced billing. It's charging you for all of the uncompensated care that it isn't being paid for by the uninsured. You're already paying for the uninsured. Isn't it time now that we pay for the uninsured, but when we do, we pay for them in a more cost-effective way, in a way that emphasizes prevention. So we don't have asthmatics, and Rhode Island has amongst the highest number of asthmatics, that visit the emergency rooms. Instead, why don't we have them get a primary care doctor that actually is there to help them manage their asthma and pay for their inhalers and their medications so they don't end up going to a thousand dollar hospital emergency room visit that they don't pay for but you do. In addition, this will provide high quality and efficient care by doing the kind of work and cost effective research. By creating medical homes, 80% of the health care dollar goes to 20% of the population. Those with the chronic illnesses, many in the senior populations, who suffer from many chronic illnesses all at once. And frankly, as you all know, many of them see multitude of different doctors. Do those doctors talk to one another? Most of the time they don't. Do they coordinate the care? Most of the time they don't. If we had what is known as a primary care doctor helping to coordinate all of those physicians' care, what a world of difference it would make, not only improving their care, but reducing the costs, now that we can begin to make sure that that care is more efficiently delivered and more effectively delivered. We have seen these medical homes demonstrated before, and they have been demonstrated to reduce costs dramatically. And when 80% of our healthcare system's dollars are caught up in chronic care management, what a difference it's going to make if we can just manage that population better, we will be able to reduce the cost of our healthcare system immeasurably. Another way we're going to reduce costs is having a strong public plan. Increasing competition in the marketplace, keeping insurers honest, and encouraging innovation, thereby improving quality. Through price negotiations with providers and drug companies, this will save us money and it'll afford us the opportunity to expand more coverage. 